Thank you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Um, uh, our latest guest today for the um, uh, name visitor seminar, whatever it's called, is uh, Mr. Kevin Schumacher from Chevron, Chevron Shipping. He graduated in uh, 2014 and 2015 with undergraduate and master's degrees from the name department. After graduating, Kevin began his career with Chevron Shipping Company in a naval architecture role. He spent a year as an expat in South Korea supporting the construction of two LNG tankers and managed the day-to-day -day repairs for 10 new build vessels. Currently, Kevin is a junior repair superintendent for VLCCs as well as coordinator of warranty repairs for Chevron's newest ships. He keeps him busy, but he has never been seen without the world's largest cup of coffee collection in his hand. That's the secret of success, I think. So, and with that, um, Mr. Kevin Schumacher. Um, yeah, so start off with, uh, yeah, I'm Kevin Schumacher. So I was, um, yeah, student here graduated in 2014 and then also did a master's degree. So I finished that in 2015. Um, got this slideshow going. Uh, so I'm from Macomb County, Michigan. Uh, I grew up on Lake St. Clair, building my whole life. Uh, back in when I started as a freshman, I talked to Warren and after about five minutes of talking to him, he had me ready to declare for naval architecture. Uh, he's a pretty convincing person. Uh, it turned out to be a, just a really fortunate thing for me to do as well. I got a lot out of being in the department. Uh, it's, you know, naval architecture, it's a really small career field, but there's really good opportunities once you're inside of it. Uh, for the last five years, ever since I graduated, I've been working for Chevron Shipping Company. So this is the branch of Chevron that uh, we run all the oil tankers, uh, LNG tankers and product carriers uh, for the corporation moving oil and gas products. Uh, as well as running tankers, we're also kind of the center for marine expertise for the company. So when they're running FPSOs or other offshore installations, they look to us to, for that experience and how to run things in a marine environment. So uh, yeah, first uh, I'll just talk a little bit about some of the jobs that I've been working on over the last five years. But then what I really want to use this time to talk about is kind of my experience in the last five years, switching from the world of being in college to having a uh, full-time job and career. Uh, last year I finished my PE license. So I have a uh, yeah, professional engineer license in naval architecture. So I was hoping to use some time to talk about the process of getting licensed and some of the things that you can start doing. And I also want to share just kind of some of the things I've learned over the years of uh, some of the mistakes that I've made, uh, things that I wish I knew uh, starting off. So uh, to get going, I've had a lot of different jobs uh, and I've been fortunate enough to spend time in a lot of different parts of the world. After my first year working in an engineering group uh, here in San Ramon, California, I was sent off as an expat to South Korea for about one year. There I was working on the construction of two LNG tankers. Uh, so I got a picture of one of them, Asia Venture. And on the right, that's the Samsung Heavy Industries shipyard in South Korea. On the background of that, you can see a really big red um, uh, structure and that's the Prelude F, uh, LNG FPSO. So while I was out there, Tyler Grill, another graduate of the department, he was out there also working on the construction of that project. And right now we also have in South Korea, uh, Clay Kane, he's a, another recent graduate. And he's working in a different shipyard on uh, construction of a couple of Aframax tankers. So after I spent a year living in Korea, um, yeah, I was spending time crawling around LNG tanks every day and uh, turning on uh, gas diesel engines for the first time. So it was just a huge amount of fun being in a shipyard every single day. Uh, after that, I switched to another group that does a lot of advisory work in other parts of the company for Chevron. 
So we uh, do a lot of work preparing structural inspections for FPSOs and other offshore assets. So during that time, I was making uh, steel instruction plans for a really big FPSO off of Nigeria. I also got spent, I was flying out in helicopters to FPSO, so I got to do some helicopter escape training where they strapped me into a seat in a little mock-up helicopter and dunk me upside down in a pool and I have to unbuckle myself, punch out a window and swim out before I drown. So it was also a pretty fun thing to do. Um, yeah, personally me, I'm not a fan of being in the office. I always look for excuses to be out in the field. So that's right up my alley. Uh, during that time, I also got involved in preparing inspections for offshore loading buoys. So on the left, that's a buoy I went to in Nigeria uh, so this is where in shallow water, they make a pipeline out from shore to deep water, and then an oil tanker can hook up to this buoy and then get the hoses to pump off oil. And on the right, I was also spending time uh, doing a lot of engineering and repair work with a LPG FSO. So in the front, this is a facility that receives uh, propane gas from shore, it cools it, and then tankers will come up and lower off the stern of it, and then we pump off propane out of those ships. After doing that for about a year and a half, I got moved into what's my current role. That's working with um, all the post delivery repairs for a series of new built chests. Two years, Ron's taken about 10 new ships uh, from South Korea, and these are main requirements that took effect. So we have, uh, there's a lot of new emission requirements that are coming into force uh, in 2020 and in the future. So these ships are equipped with scrubbers, uh, SCR, ECR systems, all sorts of uh, emissions reduction technology. So after these ships were delivered, I was then kind of the, uh, the, the main person handling warranty repairs at the shipyard. So I got to travel to South Korea a bunch of times. Um, I was out there for some of the keel layings. I sailed with a lot of ships after they were delivered. So I would get on board in Korea and ride them for a couple of weeks going to Singapore or elsewhere. And yeah, for the last two years, I've been working really closely with uh, ships and shipyards, getting different repair works done. Uh, during that time, I've gotten to go out and visit a lot of them. Uh, the ones, these pictures here, this is from a helicopter that was taken out to a ship that was off of uh, the Gulf Coast. And this picture on the right, that's from a launch out in Los Angeles. Uh, that, that one I like because that was the, uh, the last trip I got to take before the pandemic started here. And during that time of doing, um, seeing a lot of construction of ships and now I'm doing operation and I'm starting getting some of the overhaul work for our ships. So this is from a piston pull that we did back in March on uh, one of our tankers. So this is when we disassemble the cylinder head of one of the main engines and we completely pull out the, the piston rod for inspections. And that uh, the picture on the left, that's me inside of the cylinder of the engine uh, standing on top of the piston crown. Um, and then, yeah, starting next week, I'll be changing into my fifth job in the company, and that's going to be as a repair superintendent. So my role is going to be uh, doing a lot of technical management for our ships. I mainly be for about two or three ships. I'll be the main technical contact from the chief engineer, and I'll be in charge of arranging major overhauls, um, making sure when a ship shows up in part that the the parts service technicians at one time and also uh, kind of just being the driver for our company values on board the ships i uh, one things i've learned when you're operating with ships there's a really big gulf between sailors that are on a ship out at sea and then our office management so one of my jobs is to kind of bridge the cultural gaps and really drive our company culture 
So uh, that's it with the, the slides I had prepared. So, and, you know, my career, it's been uh, maybe not the traditional naval architect, uh, marine engineering role. I don't really do design work. I'm more focused on operations and construction and operation of our ships. And I think I've got a few different perspectives on just how naval architects fit in the bigger picture of our industry. And what I'm really hoping to do with the rest of the time is kind of tell you a little more about some of the different opportunities that you might not be aware of. And then also to talk about this PE licensing. I'm really hoping to hear your questions and answer and tell you as much as I can. So I'm really encouraging everyone, like I can't the participants here. So please uh, write something in the Zoom chat. Or feel free to, you know, just interrupt me. And if you got any questions, please stop me and ask, because I really want to make this as helpful for you as I can. Hey, Kevin, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, I, it, you were kind of going in and out, so I, I couldn't quite hear you when you said this. But did you say you were working on the the whole, like the design um, part of the company or whole and design or something like that? And construction, that's what you okay, said. Yeah, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't know I was uh, breaking up. Uh, yeah, thanks for letting me know about that. I'm going to, Chris just sent me a message to stop my video. That might help the audio a bit. Yeah, so my main role, I don't work as much with the design aspect. I'm more focused on the operations and repairs and maintenance for the ships. I've worked a little bit with our uh, design reviews. So when we want to order a ship, we get a specification from a shipyard where they say, here's what we're proposing to build. And then we review that and we're looking for the quality of the equipment, the details they're leaving out and figuring out what sort of changes need to be made to meet our requirements. But as um, as pure naval, architect, uh, naval architecture work goes, I don't do I don't really do that much of that. It's more the operation side. Okay, thank you. That that cleared it up for me. So I hope that answered that question. Okay, great. Yes, you um, did. Yeah, so uh, yeah, the first thing um, I'll talk a little more about is the PE licensing. So I completed that last year uh, doing the PE exam and fully getting my license and stamp. And that's a, for those of you, the professional engineer certification. So in the United States, if a person wants to offer, this is a minimum requirement to have, have this license that it shows that you have a minimum competency in engineering and that uh, you're capable of actually performing engineering work. So the license, it came out of, um, I think Wyoming was the first state around a hundred years ago where you would have engineers offering to design bridges or other structures. And these are people that didn't actually have these or competence. So they would build a bridge and there would be, you know, things would happen, there'd be collapses, people would get hurt or killed. And Wyoming started it, and then it spread state by state throughout the country. So now, for example, if you're going to work for a company like uh, Gloston or Rosenblatt, when those companies are offering to perform engineering work for uh, ship operators or shipyards, uh, the design engineers are required to have a PE license in order to certify and stamp off a drawing. There's a, so the reasons to get a PE license, uh, it's first is to be able to do that sort of work. If you're working for one of these smaller design firms, it's an absolute must to have it. If you work for Gloucester, they're going to expect you to eventually get a PE license. Uh, but there's also... Uh, for me, I don't really do design work. It's not a requirement in my job. But the reason I did it is because it's um, it's kind of just a really good thing to have in your back pocket as um, 
when you're working, applying for different jobs, it's something that will re really set you apart from other engineers. Uh, so I have on my business card, on my email signatures, I always have the PE letters at the end. Uh, recently, when you know, I've gone through layoffs at my job and when you can show that you have, you know, this above and beyond license, it's something that can really uh, set you apart if you're about even with someone else. And the license, there's three parts to it. Uh, the first is the, it's called the principles, or the, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, the fundamentals of engineering exam. And this is a test that you can take at any time. Any of you can take this test tomorrow if you wanted to. And I really strongly encourage everyone to do this while you're still in school before you graduate. This test, it's, um, it's not really specific to naval architecture. It's general engineering principles. It's stuff uh, doing uh, kind of calculus and kind of basic physics. And there's, there's really nothing too crazy about it if you prepare for it, right? Uh, it took me a couple of months of using a uh, guidebook to do some review of it. And then before I graduated, I had to go to a testing center and it's about a two hour long test. So that's um, that's your first step. And I really encourage everyone look into doing that before you graduate. It's easiest to do it while you're still in school. Once you leave school and you start working, uh, getting into the habit of studying, it becomes a lot more difficult. So I'd really encourage everyone to do that. Um, do it now, do it in the spring, uh, do it before you leave school. The second part that's required is to have four years of industry experience working under the supervision of someone with a PE license. So for that, it's gonna depend on what company you wind up working at. Uh, you'd wanna be talking to people, figure out who in your company has a PE license. And then uh, they don't actually have to be your supervisor, it's someone that you're working closely with. But find out who those people are and then you wanna be keeping detailed records of every project that you're working on. Uh, what sort of engineering expertise are required and making sure there's supervision with that uh, that coworker that has a PE license because eventually you're going to need to have a record of all those four years of experience. And then the final part of getting a PE license is the principles and practice exam. Uh, so traditionally this was taken, you had to get four years of experience first. Now a lot of states are changing those rules so you can take it um, actually any time, but every state is a little different in the rules that they require. So my state, I'm registered, I did my test, and I got my license in the state of Nevada. And the reason for that is California doesn't actually offer a license in naval architecture. So Nevada that was the closest place for me to go to and get that license. Uh, they, I believe they offer it at any time, but uh, different states, Texas, I think you have to get the industry experience first. Uh, when you do that test, that test is specific for naval architecture. It's a lot of work. Um, I spent, I started. Probably studying, I think. So it was about a five month process of studying. It's actually a really huge amount of work. I was probably working around um, around 12 hours a week of going through review books. But it's a, it's a very doable thing. Um, it's It was actually kind of enjoyable after four years of working to be uh, kind of, it's kind of like being in college again, where you're taking notes on classes, you're taking exams. And it's actually, it was kind of fun working on stuff that's as a multiple choice answer compared to the work that I do. But that test, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very draining experience, but it's definitely worthwhile to do. So I took the test in April last year. Uh, a couple months later, you get the results. I got a, you either it's pass fail, so I passed. And then I had to get different uh, recommendations from other people with PE licenses and then build up a, uh, it was a pretty big application process, but then eventually you're finished with that and you get issued a license. And with license, so I have a 
had a license, so I could technically only practice naval architecture with an office that's based in Nevada. If I was going to be working for a company in Washington State, you would have to transfer a license to Washington State. Uh, but for me, I really only did this because it looks good to have the license just as a, um, it's kind of a bit of prestige to have, to have those letters on your business card. So the actual state I got licensed in really didn't matter. So does uh, anyone have any questions about the licensing or anything about taking the tests? Uh, how does it work to do it in different states? Like do states uh, recognize, like does California recognize Nevada's license or how does that work? So uh, yeah, that one's a little complicated. I know from, I know a few people that work for Herbert Engineering, they're based in California. And most of those engineers, they hold a mechanical engineering license that's based in California. And then they also have a naval architecture license based elsewhere. But I think mainly they use a mechanical engineering and it's uh, the naval architecture, the exam, it's 70% of it is very similar to mechanical engineering for the type of work that you're doing. Uh, and then it's it's really only that extra part where you're dealing with more like stability problems um, and some of the more specific rules for shipbuilding that that's kind of the difference between the licenses. I think any of you, if you have a naval architecture degree from Michigan with enough work, any of you could get a mechanical uh, license pretty easily. But yeah, I would definitely encourage everyone, uh, while you're still in school, it, the organiz organization is called NEECS, and e -E and that's the organization that kind of controls the licensing. And try to learn some more about it and take the FE exam while you're still in school. It's a lot easier to do before you get busy with uh, jobs in life. And You'll, uh, you'll be a lot more better prepared to take it. Just you're in the habit of studying already and it's it's really not that bad for the first one. So yeah, moving on. Um, I also wanna talk a little bit kind of the things that I learned moving from working in school to working in a full-time career. It, for me personally, it was actually a, kind of a hard shift. And when you're in college, you get really used to having all your work lasts for only a semester. Uh, you're working for three or four months, then the class ends, and then you have a couple of weeks off, and then you're beginning something completely different from, from scratch. But then once you get to the working world, it's, you know, you're kind of, there is no start and finish to anything. It's kind of, uh, it's not a sprint anymore, now it's a marathon. And that actually, that was a really big uh, just shift for my mindset. After about four months of working full time, I was kind of uh, in my head wondering, you know, okay, why am I not getting a vacation for two weeks to clear my mind and like you normally would at the end of a semester? And it's not, um, there's definitely good and bad things about making that change. I think most people, by the time you're finishing your senior year, uh, you're kind of ready to be done with taking classes and exams. And it is uh, definitely a lot nicer to not have to do homework on the weekends and just do your 40 hour week. But it is definitely a change to keep in mind. Um, I definitely encourage all of you, you know, keep in touch with everyone that you're working with. You're all going to be going through kind of the same thing, like adapting to that business life. And it's definitely good to talk to as many people as you can, get advice from people. And because, uh, yeah, personally for me, it was kind of a rough transition um, just going to work every single day for the next 30 years. But once once you get your mindset right, it definitely goes a lot smoother. Uh, one thing I definitely noticed that was really beneficial after my time in the department was just seeing the kind of the mindset that you're getting with a naval architecture degree. Uh, something that I learned that's gonna set all of you apart from other engineers and companies is kind of the focus on systems engineering that you get with a naval architecture degree. 
a lot of people that you're going to meet, especially mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, they tend to be very focused on kind of the small details of operating a design. But if you're working on your senior design project, you're spending a lot of time, you know, working with all these different constraints and seeing how one variable impacts another and you're seeing how all of these things kind of mesh together all that most people really don't have in industry and i um, encourage all of you to really pay attention to that a lot when you're working on your design projects and other work because it's that's one of the most important skills you're going to get out of your michigan naval architecture degree is kind of having that high level to see how everything's working together in a system and it's it's really something that once you get into the working world, you'll see how that can uh, really set you apart from other people and really open up more opportunities because you'll be able to ask questions about how one thing is impacting 20 other things. And so I, I really didn't appreciate that while I was in school and that it's as time goes on here working in Chevron, I see that more and more. Uh, another big thing was, you know, kind of when you're in school, um, there's a lot of your, you're working on more closed ended problems where you have a homework set and there's kind of one way to do everything. There's one right answer. You start moving away from that in the design projects where things are more open ended. But generally, once you get out into the working world, you're going to see that they're you know, there's really no one set way for doing anything. Everything that you do, it's going to be uh, very open ended. You're going to have the ability to kind of work the way that you want to solve problems. And that's a really good opportunity also just to, you know, talk to as many people as you can when you're in getting your jobs, when you're in your, your internships and learn how people, the different ways that people do their work, because it's all just very, very different person to person. And there's a lot that you can gain just from um, kind of experimenting with different work styles. And it's it's kind of hard to explain now, but having had the experience, I can see how people um, with when you're working in open ended career like engineering, there's, you know, a million ways to do everything. And that's that's really that's a really uh, confusing thing for some people, but it's. Uh, definitely beneficial with your systems engineering background in naval architecture. And the other advice I can offer is to always, you're, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. There's a lot of stuff that you're not going to know. And uh, one of the best things that you can do when you're going through life is to own all of your mistakes. When, because you're going to screw things up. And if you can stand up, own it, and learn from the things that you do wrong you're going to get a lot more respect from people uh, your management is going to see a lot more integrity in the way that you're working uh, definitely don't be afraid to screw up uh, do anything wrong because it happens to everyone but the the people that stand out and move up a lot quicker are the ones that can really take ownership of something that goes wrong and how they learn from it and how they can fix problems from happening in the future Then, uh, yeah, some of the other things I've learned, it's uh, with the University of Michigan degree, you guys are gonna be experts on theoretical engineering. You're gonna know a lot about how, um, you're gonna understand, re understand really well the physics behind how machinery works and how systems work. One of the gaps that I learned about getting into the industry was kind of the operation side. Uh, in Michigan, most people, they don't get too many opportunities to be out on ships, actually seeing machinery running and seeing shipbuilding. And so one of the things that, that one of the gaps I think most people from most naval architects have in general is not having that real world experience and seeing how things actually work and how things actually break. Uh, so I encourage everyone to, you know, find internships where you can work in anything with operations with shipbuilding uh seeing 
the actually being in the yard, seeing shipbuilding be done, anything with ship checks where you get to go out on the vessels and, you know, talk to uh, the engineers, the sailors that are on the ship operating the, equi operating the equipment. And I think you will learn a ton just from, you know, talking to people that are actually operating and running equipment, because that's one of the big things that you can, um, another way to set yourself apart is to understand how things actually break down and why something can look like a good design on paper, but not be good in practice. That's uh, one, I think the Web Institute, a lot of those students, they, uh, they go out on ships during a semester uh, after their freshman and junior years. And that's one of the ways you can kind of catch up to that operational side is look for any opportunity to get involved in operations on a ship. And the other thing that is really going to help you out in your careers is to spend a lot of time learning about just communicating uh, communication. And a lot of engineers aren't the best at, you know, written or giving writing communication and giving speeches. And I definitely spent a lot of time improving myself. I've taken classes on uh, giving speeches, giving presentations. Uh, last year, I, I took a couple of classes on negotiation tactics. And when you work on those soft skills like that, that's another way that can really help out your career when you can really communicate, you know, what are, if you're negotiating for trying to change your job position, trying to convince your boss to give you a project, or anything else like that, being able to make your thoughts clear is, is, so, is so critical in a job. And another thing I've really learned is to uh, just always be humble. Um, when you go into the working world, you know, you're, when you come out of your senior year of college, you're gonna feel, you know, you're on top, you've taken all the classes, you've learned everything. But then I got a big reality check going into work where you see that all of a sudden, you know, there's not, not a lot that you really have detailed experience with. And definitely when you're starting work, it's a it's a really important time to be humble and to always accept advice from anyone that's willing to talk. Always make sure that you understand that, you know, there's always someone in the room that's smarter on a particular detail than someone else. And, you know, there's always more to learn. You're never going to be, you know, you're never going to know 100% of everything. So always try to keep humility in all the work that you're doing and uh, try to be open to people's suggestions, be open to people's comments. And that's gonna help you build better relationships with people. And, and I think that's particularly important in the naval architecture world because it's a really small industry. And I, I always get really surprised where I meet Michigan people I knew from school and stuff. I keep on, I run into a lot of people in the work that I do, whether maybe now they work for ABS and I've had my old classmates be doing the ABS reviews for designs we were submitting. I've met classmates that um, they were the engine technician for a overhaul that we were doing on a ship. And it was uh, a couple of Michigan grads were the ones that were taking measurements inside of an engine working for uh, MAN. And so I think throughout your careers, you're going to keep on running into some of the same people over and over again. So always, you know, treat people with a lot of respect, be humble, and always uh, when you're interacting with people, keep in mind that you're going to run into them again. And uh, you always want to leave good impressions on people. So I know I've been uh, giving a few just kind of uh, random tidbits, things I've learned. Um, yeah, I'd really love to hear some more questions that you guys have about whether it's looking for internships, looking for jobs, uh, any things about working in uh, different companies that you'd like to know. I've worked in shipyards. I interned in a couple of small design firms. So I've kind of seen a lot of, I've experienced being in small companies. I've experienced being in massive corporations. So I've kind of seen those different things. So if anyone has, any questions about anything about, you know, starting your career, please either uh, yeah, interrupt me or type a message in the chat because I'd love just to answer anything that you want to know moving on in your, in your careers. 
So coming to Chevron Shipping, what was something that you wish you would have learned or known before you started uh, your role there? Yeah, so one of the things, um, you know, it was kind of while I was talking more with the humility. Um, after earlier in my career, I spent a year being, I was working in a shipyard in Korea as an expat. And I was working on this big project that, you know, it was a, it was a big thing getting a ship delivered. And we had at the end, like big presentations and get little plaques and stuff. And I, and I've definitely seen this from other people I worked with where working on a big project when it gets done, it, it's one of the most satisfying things in the world, but it can also really ramp up your ego. And that was kind of a reality check for me after I came back. I started working on my next assignment where, you know, I kind of, you know, I was strutting back to the office thinking I was hot shit. And uh, I got a really quick reality check that, you know, the if you do something big, you know, it's great to celebrate your accomplishments, but um, you can't, you know, uh, think yourself as higher as other higher than other people. And, you got to really keep um, keep your ego on track. And I think there is sometimes there's that reputation. I'm sure a lot of people have heard it that University of Michigan grads can tend to be um, to have a little bit of an ego of, you know, we were one of the best schools in the world. We all know it. Um, but it's really important to, you know, be humble in everything that you're doing. And I, I've had a couple of times in my career where I got caught not doing that and I learned pretty quickly that it's really important to, you know, just, you know, uh, don't think, never think that you're higher than other people, that you're smarter than other people based off of your background or the projects that you worked on. Okay, so then, and then um, uh, that answered my question, but I also want to know, like, technical wise, what was something you you feel like you, um, I wouldn't say necessarily say you should, you felt you should have been prepared for, but what is something technical wise that you wish you would have known or had more experience with um, before you went into your role? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, there's so many different things that you can work on. There's always gonna be um, areas that, you know, you didn't, you didn't take as many classes or not. But one of my regrets, I didn't really take that many structural engineering classes. I think I took, um, I think it was just the one at the 300 level uh, for the structural engineering, but I didn't take uh, NA410. And I kind of really regretted that because there was a lot of kind of background on structural engineering that I think I had to catch up on early in my career. And another area, um, a big thing had to do a lot with marine engineering. That's kind of, it was one of the weaker areas I had coming out of school, but it turned out that's what I do the most work with now. So I wish I took some more classes on really understanding uh, things like how pumps and machinery work, hydraulic systems. I think there's a lot of good, uh, especially in the mechanical engineering department, if you can find elective classes on uh, like mechanical systems, you can get out learning how those work. Okay, that was get out of learning how. Oh. A lot of the focus is not. Is this you're going in and out? Uh, you can. Uh, breaking up a little bit, but the, yeah, the, the main thing I was going to, oh yeah, if you can't hear me right now. Okay, we can hear you now. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, sorry. This has been the start of breaking up a little bit. Um, yeah, so the kind of the biggest things, I think, um, try to spend more time learning about machinery systems, uh, learning pumps, engines, areas like that. A lot of in our degree, we tend to focus 
on the naval architecture side, there's less of a focus on the marine engineering. So learn more about the marine engineering and that'll do a lot for as you're going into your career. Thank you so much. Kevin, I have a question for you. Um, so you said you have a master's degree in naval architecture as well. Um, what caused you to want to pursue that and how has that been able to benefit you since being in the industry? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, that broke up a little bit. Yeah, so you said you had like a master's degree in naval architecture as well. Uh, I was just curious what caused you to want to pursue that as an undergrad and how has it benefited you uh, since being in the industry? Yeah, sure. So um, I did the, it was the five year master's program. Uh, I can't remember the name of it, but so it was, um, you know, the academic based master's degree. I didn't write a thesis. It was uh, just taking more classes. And at the time, the big motivation, I think um, it was, I didn't really at the time want to go out into the world yet. Um, and it was nice to do another year in college. Uh, but I think looking back, it was really beneficial just with the type of classes I was taking. I took, um, there was a systems design class with Professor Collette that that was one of the most valuable things that I did with uh, really getting more experience with systems engineering and understanding the all the things with uh, neural networks and all that um, it was more of the design work and that turned out to be really valuable just in having the background in that sort of engineering. The other um, really good thing that turned out to be really valuable for me was taking, it was a NA 599 seminar course with, uh, it was Don Winters. I think he's already retired, but it was a class on and that turned out to be one of the best classes I took because it was um, learning about how the IMO and these different regulatory agencies function and how all these things impact the commercial shipping industry. And that stuff now, a lot of what I deal with is complying with, you know, different um, environmental regulations that are coming, different things that are coming from the UN and the uh, International Maritime Organization. And having a background in that has really gotten me primed for uh, understanding what these rules are, why they matter, how they're set, and how all these different countries operate. Um, in the shipping industry, we deal with flag states, port states, um, all these different entities that control the shipping world. And it really helps to take a class on that type of stuff to understand what it is. Thank you. And I think uh, one other thing that would be good to talk about is kind of the changes that I've seen um, this year with coronavirus and how this is impacting the working world. Um, this has been yeah, near to year for everyone. I'm guessing most of you are at home and not at the university. And for work, it's definitely been, uh, yeah, kind of very different for us working. Until March, I was going down to visit ships about every, about twice a month. I'd be going down to Los Angeles or uh, San Francisco area to visit ships and spend a lot of time with crews. And I was doing that up until March, um, right up until the week when, you know, the things got crazy and Tom Hanks tested positive and all that stuff. And all of a sudden that came to a roaring stop. So in the last nine months, I haven't been to any ships. I've been to my office about four times. I've been working from home the rest of it. And it's, as you guys know, trying to do working from home, I'm sure it's not the same or a lot tougher than being at the university and being able to be in the classroom. And also in the working world, it's also been really different and, and a little difficult. Uh, I've kind of seen how uh, working from, from home, it hasn't been the worst change in the world if you can get yourself set up because a lot of the work I do, I'm working with ships and shipyards. 
So that's already kind of remote and not in person. But it is uh, it's a little tougher in your career. Um, just, you know, some of you graduating this year, you might be starting jobs remotely. And uh, we just had a person uh, in Chevron. She started about a month ago, and it's been 100% remote. And it's, you know, it's going to be something that a lot of you have to adapt to. And definitely try to, you're going to have to put a lot more effort into talking to your coworkers, getting to know them, uh, try and do like the virtual happy hours and that stuff. And it, it won't be the same as being in the same room as people and talking to them. But just, I'd say for all the seniors that are there right now, keep in mind, you're going to have to work really hard to build those relationships uh, when you're starting your first job next year. Because I think more likely than not, you might probably be starting a lot of it remotely. There is some good that comes out of it. Uh, I think for me, earlier this year, I spent two months. Uh, I live in California now. I'm from Michigan. I spent two months hanging out in Michigan with my family. And so it was kind of a, an opportunity where I can work remotely and you know, see friends and family back in Michigan for longer than I normally could. And so there's some good opportunities that come out of it, but it is it is going to be more challenging. And I think especially, you know, uh, employees under 30 tend to struggle the most with remote working. It's, uh, you, you'd think that younger people more, you know, the tech savvy stuff would be better at it. But I think when you're earlier in your career, you're really trying to focus on building relationships with your coworkers, your managers. And there, there is something you kind of lose when you, you know, you can't bump into, you know, the big managers when you're getting coffee, you miss the water cooler talk. And that's something I have to work to try to overcome. And a lot of you are going to have to work at that next year. Um, so it's, it is going to require more effort to kind of, get yourself established in your job as you start working. So kind of adding on to that, um, how would we expect to meet other people in a company if we're completely remote? Yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to think, uh, we, yeah, we did have one person start full-time recently um, in Chevron. And I know uh, you gotta kind of like talk to, you know, your first line of support is gonna be the immediate group that you're working in. And then I think you really got to make more of an effort to, you know, ask, you're going to get to know those people first and then talk to those people, ask them to introduce you to people, ask them to invite you to meetings. And you got to really, um, you know, kind of step up asking people to get you involved. And before, when you're new in an office, you know, people are going to grab you, take you into a conference room and introduce you to people. And that, you know, it's not really the same when you're doing a Zoom call. But I think, um, you know, if you can talk to people, still make, making sure you're getting introduced in a Zoom meeting, making sure that people are at least like hearing your name or aware of you, um, that can, you know, it's, it's really going to help. And, but it's, it's still doable, but you have to put a little more effort into it. Uh, since if you're joining, you know, a conference call and your video's off and you're sitting there muted, no one's going to realize that you're there. And especially you're not going to bump into people, you know, you're not physically there in the office. So you really have to put yourself out there more. Um, I think that it is challenging. I kind of struggle with that this year a lot where I kind of feel like I have lost a lot of face time with especially like upper management where you're not seeing those, the big people that can really help drive your career. So you have to, you know, kind of push yourself out of your comfort zone, you know, set meetings to talk with people and because uh, you're, you're not going to get the spontaneous interactions with people. You got to kind of make them for yourself. Yeah, thank you. But it's, yeah, it kind of surprised me. One of the talking to people, it, I think people kind of more in like their 50s and 60s where they're kind of at, you know, they're very, people that are very well settled and established in their careers. This change was actually pretty easy for a lot of those people because they're, you know, they're kind of set in what they do every day. They know how to do their job and they're not looking for as much support from other people. 
But then when I talked to other engineers, I was talking to a few people yesterday who are uh, about two years into their careers. And, you know, those are the people that seem to like, they seem to dislike remote working the most because you're losing out on kind of that support group of people around you. And especially a lot of engineers, a lot of us are pretty introverted and it's kind of easy to kind of be quiet and, you know, let things go. And you have to really push yourself to be talking to everyone and uh, getting as much support and um, being involved with people. And for a lot of people, it, it is difficult for a lot of people, I think, especially people in their early 20s and But I was, I was really, I had a really interesting conversation with someone yesterday that um, I thought, well, I'll share that too, where I was talking to her about some of the challenges. And uh, before the pandemic, she lived in a, like, she's still living in a studio apartment in, in a city. And, you know, that used to be fine. You go to sleep because you're out in the office most of the day. And then, um, you know, you're basically only there to sleep. But now all of a sudden she's, stuck in a studio apartment working all day and then you know you can't go to the bars anymore life really changed like that but it was um yeah she was telling me about how she actually started talking through our company they set up where there's therapists that you can talk to and uh, that's something i want to kind of encourage people to not be afraid to look for support um it was really i thought it was kind of inspiring listening to her being open about that because a lot of people, especially in early age, it's it's been a massive shift with coronavirus and everyone working remotely. And it's I think younger people, it kind of hits a lot of them the hardest. And I want to encourage everyone, especially you guys, too, when you're in school, you might not be at the university. And, you know, really don't there's no shame in looking for support. There's no shame in, you know, trying to talk to people because this is really challenging for everyone. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I'd like to say also just on an optimistic note that um, I think, you know, it's going to be a weird year, two years, who knows, but it's going to give a lot of people, I think, a lot more resilience and being able to adapt to different working styles and work environments. And that's one of the things I've really learned is when you're working, being able to adapt to something new is also something that managers are going to notice a lot more than other things and even though it's not just like the COVID world but being able to you know adapt to moving to a different office going out going out on ships and being able to kind of change your environment and keeping an open mindset is um those are the type people that can keep an open mind and being willing to try things differently those are the people that move up in the world it's when you kind of are fixed when you have a fixed mindset and only want to do things one way and don't want to explore different ways. Those are the people that kind of they're going to stay put where they are. So, um, you know, kind of the biggest thing I think I could leave for you guys is always, you know, be open minded about changes. And um, I think a lot of you experiencing all this stuff with COVID, you'll have a lot more resilience in trying to. And it, you have more resilience and you'll be more adaptable to working in it. I think that would do a lot of good for you starting your careers. So I think uh, that's about all I have prepared. Uh, are there any other questions? All right. Uh, so, what's the uh, favorite part about uh, your role at Chevron? I guess we could just ask that. So, could you say that one more time? What's your favorite part about working at Chevron so far? So, for me, uh, the biggest thing is getting out of the office and away from the computer and being physically out in the field. Um, that's. I'm not a big fan of being behind a desk, so I look for any opportunity to be on ships, um, getting my hands dirty. And I think 
when you're working for that's one of the benefits of working for like a bigger like a bigger corporation is that you can find more of those opportunities to get in the field. Um, I next week I'm going down to Los Angeles to visit a ship for the first time since I started. I'm really excited to be doing that. I had later today and then I have to, I can't fly down there. I have to drive and do all these different precautions and it's it's gonna be kind of weird. I'm not really sure what to expect. Uh, trying to do all the social distancing and keeping each other safe. Uh, but yeah, definitely being on ships, uh, being on boats, getting my hands dirty, that's what I like doing the most. Yeah, I would definitely have to agree with you on that. I, I would prefer to um, actually be on the job site versus being in the office. So that's good that that's um, something that's offered there. Yeah, it's great. Uh, that's the good thing about, you know, uh, big companies that are doing, that are involved in operations. There's a lot of opportunities to, you know, have yourself involved and not behind the desk. Uh, working for shipyards is really good, uh, shipbuilders, because obviously you can get in there and be in the field doing things. I, I did an internship at Newport News Shipbuilding. Um, that was quite a while ago now, but I was getting to, you know, actually be in the yard on the deck plate. And that's, yeah, it's a lot of fun doing that type of thing. And definitely some people, um, I've met people in this company who haven't been on a ship for 10 years. Others, like us, we try to get down, you know, every month. And so it's kind of, you're going to have, it's kind of the attitude that you have and how open you are to doing that type of work. Some people don't want to, um, but if you're into, you know, getting your hands dirty, this industry, you can do a lot of that. And But you got to make sure that people know that's the type of work that you want to do. Okay. Um, yeah, if there's nothing else, uh, I want to thank all of you for giving, giving me some of your time today. Um, I know it's I, I can't imagine what the semester is like for everyone there now, uh, trying to do all the remote learning. And I hope all of you the very best, um, especially for the seniors that might be here. Um, yeah, definitely try to uh, take the take the FE exam sometime this year. And yeah, I wish you all the best of luck finding jobs, starting your career. Uh, just keep an open mind on, you know, all the work that you're doing, be open to feedback uh, and just try to learn as much as you can. And yeah, good luck everyone. Kevin, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. Um, as always, your stories are great. Um, and keep in mind, you're invited back, hopefully next year, hopefully for <laughs> a football game, okay? Yep, yep, hopefully I can be there in person someday. <laughs> Right on, man. Thanks so much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, have a good day. Yeah.